Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank our panel, Kristen Murray of Maurice, Luke Dirks of the Submarine Group, Nate Tilden of Clyde Common and other Portland institutions. My name is Peter Bro. I'm the owner of Rotor Restaurants in Portland and one of the co-founders of Poached Jobs. Uh, we'd like to thank you for giving us your time to provide your uh, insights and ideas uh, to all of us. That's the chance uh, to understand how restaurants and owners are adapting to the post-COVID restaurant and dining landscape. The first question I want to talk or ask is, uh, you know, what your what in general are your plans for reopening, um, and how has that attempt at conveying that to your employees been received? So, just in general, kind of like your general thoughts on reopening once we're allowed to do so. Kristen. Um. Hi everyone. Um, thanks a lot for, for joining us and thank you Jack and, um, and Peter for organizing this. Uh, basically, I posted an online menu yesterday and I've been working really hard to even figure out how to move forward. Um, I have been communicating with staff via email a um, couple times a week checking in with them throughout the last 10 weeks, moving through the process of, um, as we all have sort of figuring out, we have the forced closure, what do we, how, how do we close the business? How do we um, sell off what we have? How do we donate the reserves that we can't sell right now that others can use? Um, what loans or grants are we able to get and then the waiting zone for those things um so it's basically reworking an entire business um and i think luke is someone that because they've been open um at ava jeans and submarine hospitality was one of the first games in town to really pivot the online so quickly that um, I, I feel like Luke could really answer this question in much more efficiently because I'm just in the process of starting. So Luke, do you want to take it at this point? Sure, happy to. Thanks Luke. Uh, yeah, hey everybody. Um, happy to be here. I guess just for some context for those that don't know our group, we, so we had um, a handful of restaurants opened in Portland in March. And um, as Kristen pointed out, we, we were kind of in early March seeing the, the writing on the wall that there was gonna be a shift to probably more takeout needs. Um, you know, at that point we hadn't been told to close. We were, we were imagining let's get a takeout business up and running so that we can kind of offset the dwindling sales, which we were experiencing as early as late um, February. So we'd already done some homework and when the closure became a necessity, we just kind of quickly turned that switch on. Um, we shifted to a, um, a parking lot pickup model only, which we've been running now for about eight weeks. Um, but we are changing it actually coming up in two weeks. We are planning on starting to engage with customers more at the front door. Like a lot of people, we are going to be doing like a counter service model. We've made the decision though that we're not going to open our dining rooms this summer unless there's a drastic change in circumstances in the industry. Um, so our reopening strategy is take what we've been doing for a, a curbside pickup model only, start to allow guests to walk up and place orders at a counter and allow the guests essentially to dictate to us how their comfort level is in terms of getting food dropped in the back of their trunk versus walking up and engaging at a counter. And what we're hoping is that over the course of the summer, it sort of shifts more to a counter service model away from the curbside, but we're keeping both streams open to allow the guests to determine that to us. Um, part two to your question, how are staff receiving that? Um, it's been hard. It's been a really hard week, actually. Um, this past two weeks, we communicated to our staff that this is our not just our emergency model of business. This is our model of business for at least probably six to twelve months. Mm -hmm. And I think that news hit hard. Where um, there was still some hope that there'd be a reopening of the restaurants 
um, that maybe that reality is starting to set in. Um, and so that's been, it's been a hard emotional couple of weeks. Well, it's been a hard emotional couple of months, but that's where we're at. And Nate, I know you're, you're kind of in the same boat as far as uh, having to, you know, relay hard news to your employees, but you're going to be doing something different with Clyde as well. Yeah, correct, Peter. I am. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm involved with a bunch of different concepts, Olympia provisions and whatnot, but, but Clyde Commons is the one we'll talk about today. Um, and after, after six weeks or so of watching everything unfold and, you know, putting everything in lockdown and cleaning and repairing and pulling my hair out, trying to figure out what to do, I realized that Clyde Common as a hundred seat restaurant with full table service and, you know, 40 plus people on staff is just not going to come back anytime soon. Um, it's a large room. It's two floors, mezzanine um, upstairs. And I just didn't see how we could get back to the normal place. And so I did. I let my staff know um, about two weeks ago that we were just, it wasn't going to come back as Clyde Common in the way that we know it and that <clears throat> the public knows it, but it's going to come back as something. Um, and so I you know, sent them a letter um, uh, letting them know this as kindly as possible. Um, some were not happy with that. One in particular went to the food media and uh, put out some false news about us. Um, which is a little side story about PR and controlling your, your story. Um, but I also didn't want them waiting by the phone for the phone call that's not going to come, um, that we're going to reopen in you know, two days and let's get back to normal because normal it does not exist anymore. Mm -hmm. So my concept with Clyde is to split it down the middle um, with, with screens, decorative screens, basically. And I'm going to create a marketplace. I'm calling it Common Market. And um, it'll have wine on the shelves and dry goods on the wall on the walls. Um, you can walk in and order off of a chalkboard menu on the wall. Um, of course, right now you can't walk in and order, or you really can't be inside there. So we'll do curbside pickup and delivery, as everyone else is is doing. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping the market makes sense for the long term. I don't know if it will, but being inside of the Ace Hotel, you know, someone coming down from their room and grabbing a bottle off the wall and some funky German chips might be a thing, who knows? And then when we're allowed to have people in the room again, um, we'll open the bar side as Clyde Tavern. And it'll be a much more casual, probably order a, a counter service situation. Um, we'll see how, what level of service we wanna go through. But for the beginning, I plan to plexiglass a whole bunch of screens in that room to uh, allow people to be as protected as possible um, it's still a very large space, so I think I can socially distance tables and run at 50% occupancy um, and be fairly safe as long as it's safe to be inside. We don't know about air conditioning, you know, pathogens moving through the air. We, I just don't know. But if I can make the Clyde Tavern uh, ta uh, room as bulletproof as possible and have staff and customers alike feel like it's their best chance to be inside having a normal experience, then that's, our, that's my best bet for reopening. And I'll just tack on one little thing really quick. So I know with, with my space, I have the smallest of all um, of us here and Maurice will not be dying in for a very long time, if not ever again. Um, I did, uh, my architect and I have been trying to reconfigure the space a little bit to turn it more into a production kitchen but the model um, is definitely moving into a proper patisserie takeout. Um, and given the neighborhood that Nate and I are in, because we're about kitty corner from each other with Clyde, um, it, we will be more curbside um, than someone stepping in. It just doesn't feel safe yet. Um, but if we are ever, allowed to do dine-in, let's say eight months a year. We've actually looked at the petite booths and putting plexiglass in between them and then putting plexiglass around the bar. Um, so if you're a six foot three man <laughs> or woman, it will still um, give room for sneeze guard, which, you know, it's, it's, it's completely asking the space to be something different. And we'll only be hiring back to start about a quarter of our staff. We already have a tiny staff to begin with, so I've been very communicative with everyone on that as well. I know it seems like we're all faced with kind of creating these these fishbowl 
environments with lots of plexiglass and lots of, uh, you know, lots of safety features. Do you guys feel that you've found good guidance from the state and from federal agencies and what you've been able, you know, I feel like we all have to kind of seek out this guidance, even though the state has put out guidance uh, last week. Um, but do you feel that your employees, that you're able to relate, convey this to your employees once you reopen and kind of work within the confines of providing a safe space to customers? Maybe yeah, Luke, I'll have you start with that one. Sure. Um, I think yes and no. I think there's been clear communication about um, safe work environment guidelines. Uh, I think we're all already in the restaurant industry, which goes through flu cold and flu season every winter. And, you know, we are already a sort of highly regulated environment. So um, it's not like we went from, you know, completely wild west, no rules to now all of a sudden we have to start washing our hands. Um, so I think a lot of the guidelines are really reinforcing a lot of the, the rules that were already in place in terms of how do employees um, come to work. I think where there has been a lot of lack of communication is actually more um, in the downside scenario. Um, with the lack of testing and the slowness of test results, I think it puts a lot of us in a really weird place where if one of our employees roommates is sick with something respiratory tomorrow they're going to go get a test what are we supposed to do and i think that's a real um it feels very vulnerable as a business owner to sort of have to navigate that by oneself and i know we've all any of us that have been open have already kind of crossed that and i think every restaurant is, is coming up with their own strategies and their own um method of being safe and, and um, protecting their employees, protecting the guests. And that's where I think, I wish there was more of a forward thinking strategy rather than just trying to keep COVID out of our spaces. How do we navigate living with this in our environment? And I think that's where we're all kind of still creating our own, our own rules at this point. Uh, let me pose this question to, uh, any one of you, do you, are, are you going to be employing a, a temperature checks on, on uh, customers coming into the space once you, I mean, Luke, you're not going to be reopening your dining rooms for a while, but you will have counter service. Like anyone coming through the door, do you feel like you would check their temperature? I did purchase uh, two no contact thermometers did you? just to have them and we'll see yep. if, if that, if that's a measure um, that increases the, the likelihood that people are, are healthy, then sure. We'll, we'll use that. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems awkward to me as a hospitality level to say like, you know, stop at the door, you know, check your temperature. Um, but we'll, we'll do whatever we need to do to, 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 to give us the best chance. Right. I mean, I think we're all trying to figure out how to mitigate doing being part of the community, saving our business in a new um, iteration on the wings of what we've created. Um, and our goal is safety first, as much as we're just trying to break even, knowing that we're maybe gonna open with 30, 40% of sales and capacity at best um out of the gate so but safety is is the priority and also moving being able to weather the storms because we will have more outbreaks we will have more um stressors and we have to really think big picture versus band-aid with um little to no saving support structure around that so thankfully we are a resilient feisty bunch. Uh, I think that works in our benefit. Definitely, definitely. I know for myself uh, with Broder, we are planning on opening up our dining rooms at a certain point and I'm conveying to, the, to my employees along with all the protocol that we have to go through to be able to kind of talk past the mask and, and, the, and to make your, you know, make the customer feel at home and try to give them a, a sense of what was um, prior to this. And that's gonna be really difficult and awkward and, and we're gonna go through all that. 
um, along with everybody else. Um, but I think that what Kristen just said um, is, is important as far as, uh, you know, dealing with this and then actually coming to a point where we may have to go into another lockdown, which kind of begs the question of like resiliency and how do we, how do we remain resilient through this? And, and uh, Nate, I'd like you to, to touch on kind of a, what is your long-term, and I would like everyone to touch on this, but what is your kind of long-term vision uh, not only for Clyde, but for your other establishments, you know, moving into this post-COVID phase um, where we can build in resiliency uh, to our restaurants. Obviously with Clyde, you have movable partitions, so there's a little bit of resiliency there, but what other measures uh, or, or structures or strategies uh, are you thinking of uh, to, to best give you the, the advantage moving forward? Right, well, we're learning that right now uh, with uh, takeaway and curbside. Um, you know, we have to rebuild all of our websites, um, build web stores. You know, I, I never would have thought I would do a web store for Clyde Common, but building it right now. And then, you know, if, if we go back in or likely when we go back into the, a pandemic, then we have that flexibility to, to know how to do those things. Um, making meal kits are, are very interesting to me. Um, my wife works for an advertising agency and I've been doing some cooking classes for, for that, those folks online. And uh, it's a ton of fun. So, you know, far chefs can do that and can be at home, you know, teaching people how to make a Caesar salad or, or you know, aioli, then let's do that. And that, that could be part of the uh, resilience long-term plan for either our business or, or for food professionals in general. Um, but yeah, we, we, we need to know what it's like to have people back in our dining room as safely as possible and then have them leave the dining room again and have a, have a plan. You know, we really, th this came on so quickly for all of us. Um, that it was just, you know, caught, caught out, out in the open, and uh, we can never do that again. Yeah. I'll just chime in and say, um, well, I guess, first of all, I want to say, I think everyone has to make the decisions about when and how to open their dining rooms on their own, and I, I, I think there's going to need to be a bunch of different strategies, because every restaurant, as we all know, is kind of its own special little um, snowflake. Uh, and our strategy is currently that, um, and we, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but we're going to preserve the dining room experience for when something truly festive and, um, social can happen again. Um, so we've decided not to sort of bend the dining rooms into something that is legal. Uh, we're just going to keep them unoccupied for now. Um, we've decided that that's our path forward until we feel like there's a, a, a new era established. Um, be amazing if that was this year. I think it's more likely it's next year. Um, and so our longer term model is diversifying revenue streams. So for us, that means um, continuing to do ready-made home meal kits, um, selling larder and dry good items, selling people wine, um, and also then pivoting into something where it's more of a ready to consume food out the front door, um, takeout models. Uh, I think Nate touched on an important point, which is media. Um, I think it's super important to remember that just a few months ago, we were all living in what some were calling kind of the golden era of the, the modern restaurant. Um, there's more interest in food and food culture than there's ever been in the United States. And I think, those that are going to be successful are going to get their customer experience into someone's dining room at home, into someone's kitchen at home, teaching people how to do things, um, you know, giving people online demos and doing great photography and social media work, I think is all super important for the future of the restaurant industry. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think that that part of the restaurant, that part of the industry is really going to really going to grow. And, and probably see the need for more people into more people to enter that space. Yeah. You could almost you could almost see like a, a person out of their house kind of creating their own restaurant scenario, restaurant vibe and and kind of starting off that way, which is an interesting prospect rather than having to go through a, a food cart or a brick and mortar experience or a pop up. Um, that's interesting. Um, there are other there are other pieces to the marketing aspect of this but i think that you guys have really highlighted one of the most important ones moving forward which will be that type of social media um, piece of it 
Um, I want to touch real quick on, on uh, third party apps like delivery services and how restaurants can kind of get out from underneath that or move aside, move around those. And if you guys are contemplating any, any hacks or any other, any other strategy to, to not involve those, I know a lot of us are talking about asking people to come directly and pick up from the restaurant and not use those third party apps because of the expense. Um, Nate, do you want to touch on that? Sure. Um, going with the third party apps, extremely expensive. Yes. Um, they, they take upwards of 30% um, off the top and then they charge delivery fees and service fees to, to the end user, to the customer. Um, the, they're also very convenient. So, from my, myself with Clyde Common, I'm trying to get a menu um, up and ready to go for, you know, next week. And I don't have the time right now to figure out how to do my own delivery or, a, you know, something that makes more sense financially. It's easier just to push the button and go like, cool, we're, we're live, we're in the kitchen. Right. Um, great. Now, now the goal for next week is how to start to bring people down to our curb and uh, do no contacts, you know, um, you know, you know, uh, curbside pickup. So, how, you know, what format are they calling or emailing in? How does that get into our POS system? Um, how does that talk to the printer and put out a ticket? And of course, the food is cooked, it's boxed, it's bagged. And what format do we go out the door? Nothing that's rocket science. We'll, we'll figure it out. But that's that's how the delivery apps for me personally are attractive to just get the toe in the water. And then as the, as I go all the way in for swimming, I want a much smarter system. Um, that does not take, you know, basically any chance to see any kind of break even off of your food and cover your bills and start to get people back. It's just evaporated into a third party app. Exactly. Kristen, would you comment on that considering the, you know, your type of food? Um, yeah, yeah, you bet. Well, I mean, I've, I've had to restructure and really be as thoughtful as I can with the menu because so much of what I've spent the last six and a half years doesn't necessarily translate to travel. Um, and, and then also trying to figure out how do I emulate the experience of Maurice into an online format and so spending the time with the photography like Luke was talking about the storyboard of how this thing came to be and then what what will that mean to you um, and uh, for me I've offered some of the service staff to like I thought of okay we're we're basically going to need a three to four day prep window after orders are pre-ordered, pre-paid, so I can use that money to pay for the product, get it in, do the prep. Um, we'll do pickup on Saturday only between, you know, four hours. And then Sunday I've offered Fika for the people. So you can stay at home and you can have us deliver to you. That enables the serve, primarily the people that were service staff to do that um, for us as well as help with the packaging and do some light kitchen work. Um, it, it's not in my interest or the staff's interest to hire a third party. We're small enough and need that extra work to divide between each other, to put it all back into the house and in each other's pockets. Um, so that's where I stand on that and it has been, a nightmare putting together the online menu as much as it has been sweet but it's like this morning I confirmed a lot of the orders because I can't figure out how the hell to do the timing of everything exactly it doesn't have that in it right now so I have to figure that next step out but it was very sweet to email these people and have them say specific stories of what they were excited to get, what they missed, what they're hoping that we'll introduce. And I think that dialogue is important for all of our stories because we are part of the community and more people are going to be doing at home for a long time. Um, and creating a healthier way for them to do that too, even with some really delicious frites that Nate is gonna include or you know, the meatballs lasagna that Ava Jeans is doing or my set brioche, like kind of the sweet things that give, give them that hug that we really can't do anymore right now. So, sorry, long answer. 
No, oh, good answer. Good answer. Luke, I, I think that you guys, since you've been doing the curbside pickup the longest on this panel, um, what have what has uh, the response been from the people that have been enjoying it? Well, I think it's one of the funny things about this era that we're living through is I think a bunch of people have been enjoying the drive and sitting in the parking lot as a reason to get out of their house. Um, I've seen a bunch of families who have kids trapped in the back seat, and it's obvious to me that they were just figuring out how to fill two hours. Um, but that's obviously not the plan moving forward. Um, we are building the foundation for something that I think eventually could go to a third party online app. We're not there yet. Um, little examples like what Kristen was mentioning, timing of things is actually like a problem that none of us ever used to have to think about because the throttle on our kitchen was how many seats we had in the dining room. Yeah. And now if you open up your pizza orders at four o'clock, you could potentially be overwhelmed with orders in the first 20 minutes and not be able to fill, fulfill some of those orders until 9 p.m. That's been some of our pain points. It honestly has been the feedback from people who are used to being able to sort of deal with restaurants who are always in the takeout game, who have those systems already locked down, um, where we've been saying, hey, we're not, we, we love your order, we're not gonna have it ready for two hours. That's been a hard thing for us. So we're not ready to turn on the third party app system yet and just get bombarded. I mean, that would be a, a fun problem to have, but we're not ready to fulfill that kind of order yet. Um, I've heard talk of restaurants banding together and sharing front of house staff to sort of create a joint Portland delivery system. I think those, those talks are amazing and I'd love to see it happen. Um, I know some of the challenges have been around like, shared liability and shared revenues and all that stuff, which is real. Um, for now, we're gonna stick to, you come and pick it up from us until we feel like we have a way of actively engaging with the third party. Yeah, it almost seems like that's the way for them to, yeah. instead of coming to your dining room, just come and get your food and take it home. Yeah. And that, you know, that uh, response is kind of just uh, akin to coming to dine in with you. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we we, we brainstormed ideas around that that could be fun. I um, mean, at Bar Casa Valle, we have a large parking lot, and uh, let's get some uh, flamingo guitar in the, in the yeah. parking lot and put on a bit of a exactly. show, you know? Yeah. I like the idea of a, of a kind of a co-opted delivery service for Portland only. I think that, and I've heard other ruminations about that. I like that idea a lot. I hope that we could have, all have a larger discussion about that and someone comes forward with a, a real plan with that would be great. Yeah. I'm seeing on the comments here that we're getting uh, comments about PPP and EIDL, and I'd like to, to uh, pivot to that discussion. Um, and I, I want to hear, and I'm going to start with Nate on this, um, just to what, your, uh, what you're anticipating with how you're spending your PPP money, uh, and if you've gotten the EIDL and plan to, to use that as well. Um, and uh, and also we'll we'll touch upon kind of what's been happening with the uh, PIRA and their advocacy towards getting uh, getting better plans in place or adjusting the PPP to a longer period. But Nate, I'd like to hear your uh, just your thoughts on how you're spending the PPP. Well, so far I'm not spending the PPP. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just holding on to it. You know, when we when we got it in what uh, later April. Um, the rules were, were that we had to hire 75% of our staff back within 10 days and maintain that staffing level for two months. Um, I knew that with Clyde, we weren't gonna bring back 75% of our staff. We might bring back 20% of our staff, I don't know. So uh, my first reaction to PPP was like, I'll take the low loan, so low interest loan, and as of next you know, December, I'm on the hook for X amount of money, and I have to build a business model that can generate that amount of monthly net revenue to pay back this, this uh, government loan. With a two year uh, payback. Two, two years. With a two year <laughs> payback, right. Okay, you know, I mean, I, I like these little challenges as a business owner, you know, it's like how many, you know, of, of, of these, how many cupcakes do I have to sell to make rent? You know, 2,000, all right guys, we're selling cupcakes. That's, that's, you know, that's the business we're in. Um, now, now the PPP uh, um, rules have changed. Uh, they're giving us a longer grace period and they're talking about making that grace period longer. So what if the PPP becomes, you know, 28 week grace period? 
Will I hire back 75% of the staff? Maybe, you know, I mean, it's a different business model, but between the market doing breakfast, lunch, and curbside pickup takeaway, and the tavern being open from four till 10 for happy hour, and hopefully a bustling, fun tavern scene, maybe I do have 75% back. I would love to take a loan forgiveness. It'd be amazing. But, you know, right now I'm like, I'm on, I'm 50 50, whether that's going to happen. And EIDL never came calling. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I did hear, though, that the EIDL um, is giving the up to $10,000 grant that is forgivable, uh, forgiven. Um, but if you do take the PPP, then that comes out of your PPP or you can't use that grant. It's a reduction of the amount of PPP you can have forgiven. So it's and I two. fall in that category. Do you? Yeah. Sorry, Nate. Yeah, where I was able to get the EDIL grant, and then it took off from what I was able to get for the PPP. Um, and I am kind of in the same boat as you, holding on to the majority of it, just because I'm waiting and hoping for the terms to improve. Um, so I've only... And I've used the grant to pay for new equipment and uh, shelving and storage for the new production. Mapus Maurice, if you will. Yes. And Luke, have you, uh, have you touched any of the PPP? Have you rolled that into payroll considering you're already, you're, you're running staff? Yeah. Yeah, Good. you guys are making me nervous that I'm doing the wrong thing here, but um, I don't think any of us know what's wrong just yet, as far as so, you no. Know. We we received PPP funding. Um, we decided that I would, we would. Um, the met- the metaphor I'm thinking of is sort of like we were we're essentially using the PPP funding as scaffolding to to sustain something while we build what's inside the scaffolding and hopefully then when the scaffolding comes down, there's a business there that is sustainable after the PPP, you know, windows close. Um, It is a little frustrating that we started building something with the understanding around an eight week scaffolding that might be more like 24 week scaffolding. I'm still happy to have an extension, but um, it has been hard to sort of navigate that. And I share that with this panel just because I think there's probably a bunch of people listening who are like, I don't know what to do. I'm getting 10 different versions of what to do. And I think if you're feeling that way, so is everyone on this panel. Um, So what we're doing is we're trying to use it as intentionally as possible for the intended purposes, which are payroll, um, rent, and uh, a few other expenses. And we're sort of throwing ourselves at the court to hopefully be able to present something that it looks forgivable at the end. But honestly, the the hoops to jump through are kind of impossible. Um, I'm encouraged to see legislature leaning towards forgiveness and modifying things for the restaurant industry. And my hope is that that continues. Um, We applied for the emergency loans. We did receive the $10,000 grants. Um, We did not apply for loans via that um, mechanism because I'm trying to avoid adding any debt to our business when this is all over. I did apply for about 10 different grants um, out of the gate that were for small business, women owned, and um, the um, emergency disaster grant was the only one that that came through, which was pretty interesting. I mean, it's um, like Nate was saying, and like we all have said, our industry was hit by storm with no warning um and so i think everybody is doing a commendable job trying to figure out the best way to move forward it is going to look different for all of us you have to really um we all have to we're all humans we all have to look at ourselves in the mirror every morning and do right um by what feels right and there's still a lot that's not quite safe um And I think it's not about a race or sprinting forward. It's about really careful steps to be able to understand your footing and keep those imprints. Um, Yeah. And I think that, you know, that touches on getting us all to a point where we're sustainably kind of nested and, and able to, to have a viable business long-term. I think that, 
you know, with regard to these loans, my feeling is that most of them are going to be refinanced on some level. So with the PPP funding, if it gets extended, that two-year uh, payback schedule may may also get extended as well. Um, and the e, EDIL, or is it EIDL? I think it's EDIL alone, um, has a 30-year has a payback at 3.75%, which as far as money goes is a is a pretty you know good rate long runway odd for a restaurant but still a good a good runway um i want to touch on the fact that you know we talk about advocacy um or pira and and irc have been good advocates for the restaurant industry really super important in this fight that have helped develop um or develop to help change the structures around these loans um and I don't know if we have time to go into touching upon advocacy moving forward, but I think that that type of advocacy moving forward is going to be very important for our industry to help adjust those loans. Um, if there's, you know, intransigence, intransigence in, in DC um, and an unwillingness on the part of, you know, the government to, to not restructure those loans for us. So all of us really supporting PIRA and IRC um, is really important. I think that advocacy is going to be a long-term uh, component of our industry. Um, and I think that um, we all need to bring up the fact that Earl Blumenhauer put forward the $120 billion um, proposal um, to, uh, to Congress because it's, it's so critical and we need that lifeline. We don't need loans. We don't need debt. Um, it has to be for small businesses, true small businesses that are not chains. Um, and that proposal called the Restaurant Act is $120 billion for independent restaurants with no more than 20 locations. Um, yeah. So that would mean that there's no chains in that, which is good. Hopefully there'll be no loopholes uh, in, inherent in that. Jack, how are we looking it's on- It's important. Our, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Luke. I just I'm wanted sorry. to say that I think it's important to point out that I think some of the reason that um, Representative Blumenauer did what he did is actually a direct result from the um, the IRC, which is kind of the the national group of independent restaurants, and the PIRA group that's still kind of yet to be defined, but is a loose-knit group of restaurants here in Definitely. Portland. So I think it's important to point out that those victories can be won, and that one of the results of this, I hope, is that restaurants that are small and independent, I think, have been kind of riding on the coattails of bigger industry groups. And I think we need to come out of this with a new sense that we advocate for ourselves for with our peers and that we don't wait for national restaurant association groups to sort of do things for us. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point. Jack, how are we looking on time? Well, we're at 1.45. Uh, we wanted to run to right now, but if everybody's willing to give us another five minutes or so, I can uh, take a couple questions from chat. Uh, if I don't get to your question on chat, uh, you, I do, I've grabbed your names and uh, also follow up with me by email and I'll do my best to get that answer for you. So just kind of grabbing from the hat. Uh, I wanted to start with you, Nate, on this one. Nathan asks, what is the feedback from staff regarding how comfortable they are to come back to work? Um, you know, people seem to want to come back to work and we're talking about ways to make the rooms as safe as possible. So obviously, you know, face mask, glove, uh, face shields, um, you know, I think the, the initial fear, and, and there was a ton of fear. I mean, we, we closed two days before, um, you know, Go Governor Brown said we had to shut down. Um, and it was a Sunday afternoon and my phone was ringing and people were like, I don't want to come to work. And I was like, great, we're done. Closed. Yep. Lock the door. Um, I don't sense a lot of fear. I sense a lot of let's figure this puzzle out and, uh, you know, let's get back to it. They've been at home you know, you know, painting every single corner of their house for the last two months, they, they want to come back. So if we, if we reopen and we, and it, and, it, and the cases spiral upwards, yeah, there'll be fear and we're going to close again. There's no way we're going to be inside a restaurant. Um, if it's not working. And then, uh, kind of related, but I really, I'd been thinking about this. So I'll ask this to Luke. I'm curious about your plan. Dan asks, Curious about plans when uh, dining rooms do reopen. 
what roles do you see masks playing? Not only for front of house staff, but for as a chef, I worry about cooks having to wear masks and being able to taste food and maintain safe practices as well. So how will masks affect how restaurant service works, both front of house and back of house? Well, I touched on this earlier and I'm, I, don't, I certainly don't mean to be negative if, but for those of you that are opening your dining rooms when it becomes legal to do so, but um, our particular restaurants, I find to be um, not, not the same place if a server is wearing a mask and gloves. Um, so we've made the decision that we won't open until we feel like we can do so safely without masks. Um, and that's not to criticize how important masks are in this moment. They're super important. But we just aren't going to try to open up full service restaurants while that's still part of our life. Um, currently, our our policy with, as we are running a kitchen is that everyone wears a mask. Um, we've all gotten used to that weird new normal. Um, and uh, we are kind of learning the new etiquettes and the new ways of, of doing things. But um, that's, that's my answer in terms of uh, how the front of house is going to react to it. When we do open our counter service model on June 2nd, those folks obviously will be wearing masks. And I feel better about that because I feel like it aligns with that type of experience. Does anybody else want to touch uh, masks, both front of house, back of house? Well, we won't have front of the house for a very long time. Or, um, but I know that I've been talking a lot um, with my staff and basically our plan is we're all gonna have our temperatures um, taken in the morning before we come in as well. And then we'll have a separate outfit that we'll wear at the shop, not our outside clothes. We'll have masks while we're cooking and baking. Um, anything that's not warmed will be with, um, you know, put into the box with gloves will have the masks around your ears so you can wash your hands, take it off, grab a tasting spoon, taste what you're making. I mean, it's just, it's a whole different thing. Drop the spoon, wash your hands, put the mask back on. I mean, there's just lots of extra steps that are gonna take much longer that are gonna feel very foreign. Um, but right now that's what, I feel and we feel that we need to do um, because we're not doctors, we're not nurses, and we really care about taking as many measures, even if it seems kind of extreme. Um, it's better than the alternative. But again, none of us are experts in this. We're, we're just doing the best we can with what we know. We're doing, we're doing mask gloves, face shields, I see. Um, Natalie coming on face shields. Yeah, I have face shields. I, I intend to have, if someone's on the door controlling the flow of people coming and going, you know, how many people are in the room with a clicker, they're definitely gonna be in a face shield. Um, I, Jeffrey Morgenthaler and I are trying to figure out how to make a cocktail without touching anything. How, how to get the glass on, on the bar, how to get ice into the shaker. You know, obviously shaking, that's, that's fine. And then how do you get the, 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 the cocktail? How do you get the Negroni through the little plexiglass window <laughs> you know i was i was actually thinking if you have like the beer hat you know like people have with all the and then the the cocktail can pour into the hat and then it kind of goes maybe i don't know you're this hired let's just do it <laughs> you know contact you i'm really thinking out of the box i mean thinking out of the box is going to be the way to to get to, to to do this yeah right no wrong answer is there mm. Are any of you considering uh, having guests wear masks? Yes. Yes. And, and I know that some people are not wearing masks. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the city a decent amount and I definitely see people who, you know, want to go to the hardware store and they don't want to wear a mask. And the, the hardware store has disposable masks and they're requiring you to wear them. And uh, there's a little bit of pushback. So I'm curious, you know, what will happen our first, when the first customer says no? And I think, I think we say that's your choice, totally understand, um, but you can't come in. And maybe we lose a customer for life or maybe you lose a, a whole group of customers for life. But I think that's a rule that we're not gonna invent. Yeah, I, I feel the same. And I have put it on all of the new menu, on all of the correspondence with everyone. I've even um, 
entertain the idea of posting a sign at the shop, letting customers know that if for some reason you're not willing or able to follow the protocol, we have a mask for you. If at that time you're not willing and able to follow the protocol, your purchased food will be donated to the nearest shelter. Thank you for supporting us. Be well, be safe. I don't, um, and I hate to be that guy, but um, I think we kind of need to be that guy right now. Mm -hmm. Luke, what are you guys doing? And I'm sure you've had both scenarios happen. Well, no one's coming into our spaces. So we're, right. not, we're not in a place where we need to tell someone to put a mask on. Is that what you were asking? Just as, as far as like when, when people pick up and they're coming out and they're interacting and opening up the car mm -hmm. for you to do contactless, mm -hmm. how, how are you mitigating that? What so, are you asking them to do? When you, when you place an order with us, we text you a pickup time. When you arrive in our parking lot, you're prompted to call us and let us know that you're out there. We have a little bit of a script that we do and we say, please have your trunk fully opened so that we can place the food in your trunk without touching your car. Our staff come out masked, drop food in trunk, Usually there's a sort of awkward through the mask, through the window um, exchange of conversation where we say, hey, I'm gonna leave your trunk open so that I don't touch your car, have a great day, and then we go. Um, some people don't get it. They ask, hey, could you close the trunk for me? Or, um, you know, and we're trying to be respectful and generous without um, touching anyone's cars. So it's kind of a weird um, scenario, but that's how we're handling it currently. Okay, thank you. Great. It's also been interesting to see how customers are on various levels of the spectrum. Some people pull up and they don't even want us to put the food in their car. They just ask us to leave it outside so they can come pick it up. Um, so we're just trying to kind of feel that out and, and protect our staff first and foremost and then sort of meet people where they're at. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm buying a pizza wheel to basically put it put the bags on it so if someone, mm -hmm. so that's how we're gonna do it, and then sanitize the pizza wheel in between <laughs> is the thought. Smart, we'll see yeah. how it goes. That's great. I don't know. Good solution. Yeah, I went Not to Spelton Star but... recently, and they'd set up a card table in the door to hold the door open, and it was about an eight foot card table, and they had some baking sheets. And mm -hmm. you show up and you kind of yell, oh, it's Jack to pick up the ice cream, and they put it on the baking sheet and they kind of slide it out, and you grab it and then they slide it back. Mm -hmm. And so they, 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 I was pretty impressed by how they looked at the tools that they had in house uh, and to make a no, a no contact situation uh, and just, you know, being able to make that up on the fly. And I was, I was impressed by how thoughtful it was. Are there any other questions? Yeah, so uh, we're at, we're 10 minutes over. So I just wanted to thank everybody for participating. Uh, thank you for everyone for coming and listening to this discussion. Uh, we're looking forward to doing more of these Zoom meetings. And so keep an eye out um, uh, on our newsletter and through other channels. Uh, I also, I'll be uh, taking a recording of this and uh, putting it up on YouTube, and I'll be distributing that link uh, to everyone that registered. Uh, so feel free to share that. Uh, we'll be putting that out on our newsletter as well. So uh, with that, I'll pass back to Pete for a quick goodbye, and thanks again to the panel. And I just want to say the same. Thank you, Kristen, Luke, and Nate. Um, really appreciate all of your insights and, uh, and ideas. Um, I hope that we can continue all to do this and, and bring in some other people from other areas of the restaurant industry, uh, the hospitality industry in general. Um, and thanks to Poached for, for hosting this. I think it's, uh, I hope it'll turn into something more, uh, more regular. So thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Thank you. Be well. Take care. It's the Zoom awkward goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>